Welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Jo Stanley and today our favourite doctor is in the house. Welcome, Dr Nick Carr. And it's lovely to be here, Jo, and uh, I'm getting quite comfortable in this gig, you know. I'm getting used to quite like being in Darcy's chair. <laughs> well, I'm sure <laughs> Darcy won't mind you keeping it warm. Doesn't even matter because he's not here. And we love having you here. You're one of hundreds of thousands of healthcare professionals in Australia who we've all leaned on and appreciated more than ever in recent times. But COVID and the flu season means our GPs, hospitals and ambulance services are seriously overstretched. So please make sure an ambulance or triple zero call is really needed. It's something that Jackie Felgate has been committed to highlighting as well, I know. Hi there, Jackie. Great to have you again. Lovely to be here. Hi, Joe. Hi, Nick. And you're so right. Our hospitals and paramedics need a bit of TLC themselves right now. They do incredible work, including in the field of research, which is where we kick off this week's health news. Researchers at Melbourne's RMIT have made a breakthrough discovery that could allow critically needed human organs to be preserved and stored for longer. The research team is investigating new ways of cooling biological specimens. This means donations for human transplants could be kept in a storage bank that will help shorten or end transplant waiting lists. If it all goes to plan, this will give new hope to the 1,800 Australians currently waiting for life-saving organs. And there's a massive shortage of organ donors in Australia at the moment. And around about 60% of donated organs are, in fact, the hearts and lungs. They're discarded. And the window to get these organs from a donor to a recipient is just a few hours. Mm. Well, it's timely news as Donate Life Week is about to kick off and we'll talk more about that later in the show. From saving human lives to saving the planet, Joe, right now, it's Plastic Free July, a global initiative urging all of us to help rid the world of plastic. Scientists recently found microplastics in fresh Antarctic snow for the very first time. It's such a worry, isn't it? It really is. And eight million tonnes of plastic end up in the oceans each year with catastrophic consequences for wildlife. 90% of the world's seabirds have fragments of plastic in their stomachs. It is one of the world's great challenges. And now there's a new hero in the battle against ocean pollution. It's called the Waste Shark. I love this name. The world's first marine robot designed specifically to eat waste and catch plastic before it reaches our oceans. The floating drone operates close to the shore and captures waste before it gets out to the open sea. In five days, the Waste Shark can collect more than 15 tonnes of rubbish a year. It's already been trialled in several countries and there are plans to expand its use globally. I love this so much, Jack, because don't you feel like the fight against plastic is this massive, massive problem and we're just, you know, one little cog in that whole issue and I, I love that it feels like... There are big, there's bigger solutions at play here. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Hope is where it's at, Joe. absolutely. And this week's final story gives us all just that. Scientists have discovered a subpopulation of polar bears living in remote southeast Greenland that appear to have adapted to climate change. Most polar bears depend on sea ice, as you know, to survive, a major problem given that Arctic sea ice is melting away literally. But this isolated population that's gone unnoticed for hundreds of years relies on glacial ice to survive. Their discovery is part of a NASA-backed study that's tracked Greenland's bears for seven years. Oh, well, I mean, I, I always say I don't know why we have NASA because I don't really care about space, but when they're doing something <laughs> really important for this yeah. planet, I love that. Anything for polar bears has to be good. I agree, I agree. Thanks so much, Jackie. Amazing stuff as always. As we just mentioned, hundreds of Australians are currently on waiting lists for life-saving organ transplants. The call-out for more donors is happening right now, so get on board. That's next on the House of Wellness.
Welcome back. Today we're giving a massive shout out to our healthcare professionals like you, Dr Nick, and the great work that you do. Because should we get seriously ill or injured, we're really fortunate to know world-class care is at hand and we are so lucky in this country, Nick. <laughs> well, thanks, Jo. Um, and, of course, it's the doctors and nurses have been working really hard, but it's everyone else, the allied health... And funnily enough, at my practice, sometimes it's the receptionists who've been really under the pump. So spare a thought for them. They're working really hard. Too. Yeah, absolutely. I think when... Because my daughter's often at hospitals with out, outpatient care and I see the cleaners and the orderlies working incredibly hard there and I am so grateful to them. I couldn't agree more. And anyone can do their bit to save lives too by becoming an organ donor. Simply register or tick your name off on your driver's licence. Have you done it yet, Jo? Well, do you know I have, but I didn't do it until I started doing this show. It was House of Wonders that made me go, why haven't I done it? Like, it is one of those things that only registers when weeks like Organ Donor Awareness Week comes around. And it's so easy to do. While most of us have no hesitation in saying how important it is to be an organ and tissue donor, only one in three are currently registered. And I, I wonder why that is. Well, I, I do get it because it's, it's quite a confronting thing to think about doing, having your organs donated after death. But we know that the majority of Australians promote it, they want it done, they, and they want it for themselves, but only about one in three get round to it. And some of that's just inertia, so these sorts of weeks are really important to remind people. And let's get down there, let's sign up. Well, one person donating their organs means up to seven people can come off the transplant list. That is a significant impact for people who can go on to lead full and active lives. And Australia is internationally recognised for its successful organ transplants. Each one involves a specialist team who work tirelessly to make them happen and provide a life-saving link between recipients and the donors who give the ultimate gift of life. Brisbane's Jalen Rongo was a perfectly healthy, active 17-year-old when he began to experience what he thought were only mild health issues. Shortness of breath, small cough, hit, hit, um, pain in my chest, nothing too big. Jalen brushed these symptoms off as nothing more than a chest infection. But after several days without any improvement, his mother Ariana decided it was better to be safe than sorry and took him to the local emergency department. The doctor that came in and checked on us, she took his pulse. And after she took his pulse and realised how high his heart rate is, she actually came back in with a group of cardiologists. And that's when I knew something was not quite right. Um, but the extent of what was happening, I, I don't think I even fathomed. Just keep an eye on your speed. After doing a few more tests, we were told that he had an enlarged heart, a blood clot um, and fluid around his heart. Jalen was quickly transferred to the Prince Charles Hospital Coronary Care Unit, where he was seen by cardiologist Dr George Javorski. So Jalen's problem was that he had a viral infection a couple of weeks earlier. He had still been playing football and then the heart stopped pumping well, basically. OK, so this is an ultrasound of Jalen's heart when he first turned up to hospital. This is the left side of his heart and it's very large. It's about three times the size of a normal heart and the squeezing function is down to about 10%. So it's a very, very sick heart. Yeah, my reaction was really nothing, to be honest. I couldn't really believe it at first. I was feeling sick, terrified. I, yeah, I probably can't even put into words how I felt at that moment, knowing that something serious was wrong. I'm just gonna listen to your heart there. Straight away we knew that he was in trouble and so that we needed to pull out all stops to keep him alive and to see could we get things better with medications. But it became very clear very quickly that that was not enough and that he would need a transplant. With no time to lose, Jalen was placed on a national list of patients in urgent need of a heart transplant. But for any organ transplant to occur, a suitable donor has to be identified under extremely specific medical circumstances. Yeah, so it's incredibly rare for someone to become an organ donor. Uh, only about 2% of people who die in hospital can be considered for organ donation. A person needs to be in the intensive care unit or in the emergency department, connected to a ventilator and on life support medication, essentially. Donate Life Victoria's Megan Bruns is responsible for communicating with families of critically unwell patients about the possibility of organ donation at the end of life. 
it's quite challenging at times. We're always dealing with families who are often going through the worst, you know, moments of their lives and navigating those reactions to grief, um, which are always different for every family. If you register on the organ donor registry, then we know what your wishes are at end of life. And then we give that information to families. I think nine out of 10 times, if they know what their loved one's wishes were, um, it makes that decision so much more easier. It is a very complex process to undertake a transplant. There is the donor family who need to be aware of the potential for donation from their loved one, that that were their wishes. Then we have to get the right size and the blood group. And so you can't just put anyone's heart into someone else because otherwise the body would reject the organ. It is a matter of planets aligning, especially when we only do 80 to 100 heart transplants per year in the whole country, in a country of 26 million people. That's not enough. And we have many people on our waiting lists, and some people will die waiting for an organ. When I was told that we, um, I needed to be put on the list, um, that's probably when it hit me that it's getting very, very serious, and I was starting to get a bit worried at that time. I guess the biggest worry was, you know, the time. We knew how sick he was. We knew how quickly we needed a heart. Um, so, yeah, it was just the waiting, really. Almost two weeks after Jalen was placed on the urgent wait list, a potential donor was identified. But even delivering an organ to the recipient is no simple task. Often there's multiple organs that need to go to all different centres, either locally, interstate or at times internationally. We often call on police at times um, to help transport organs to an aeroplane waiting at the airport and they go lights and sirens, really to ensure that organ gets to the transplanting centre as quick as possible. Thanks to the tireless efforts of countless people across the country, Jalen received a heart transplant in the nick of time. When someone is as sick as Jalen was in our intensive care, each day makes a difference. And the sooner he got a heart transplant, the better it was for him long term. And the great thing to say is that once he got his heart, he was actually discharged home within 15 days. We'll go up to six, make your work a little bit harder. <laughs> he looks like a young man should be at his age, functioning well and physically able to do everything he wants to do. Oh, I'm great today. Way better than what it was, yeah. Being like, do anything now. I think if I was to say anything to the donor family, I think what I would want them to know is that they saved his life with the gift that they gave and the fact that, you know, he was so young at the time that he got sick and he still had his entire life ahead of them. I really think that I would just want them to know how grateful we are and, you know, all of those words are just not enough for the gift that they have given us. One donor can save up to seven people's lives and transform the lives of many people. And it's pretty phenomenal that, you know, that's the outcome. Families that I do speak to, you know, donor families, they often say that this is just a, one good thing that can come out of such a tragic, often unexpected circumstance. And it really just gives them, you know, a sense of hope that their loved one, you know, may be living on in someone else and that the recipient, their families don't have to go through what they've had to go through. We really encourage um, everyone to register their decision on the Australian Organ Donor Registry and not just to do that as well, it's really important that you have that conversation and you let your loved ones and your family members know of your decision that you've made. So if unfortunately if that time does come for them to make that decision, then they know what your wishes are. Donate Life Week is all about encouraging people to become donors. It starts on Sunday, July 24, so head to the Donate Life website to find out how you can register. And Australia has been a world leader in the field of organ transplants. And the first were corneal transplants way back in the 1940s. And our first successful living kidney transplant occurred at South Australia's Queen Elizabeth Hospital in 1965. And of course, Surgeon Victor Chang was a modern heart transplant pioneer, notably saving the life of the young Fiona Coote in 1984. And since then, we've come a really long way, haven't we, Jo? You know, I remember that in the 80s when Fiona got that heart. I was 12 at the time and it absolutely blew my mind. Well, I was working in the UK at that point and it was big news even over there. Amazing. Well, up next, we lift the lid on male fertility. Plus, Heinz is here to deliver a masterclass on composting here on the House of Wellness. <laughs> We 
within the trillions of cells in our bodies is a very special fuel that keeps us not just healthy, but alive. Mitochondria are the, basically the energy centres within every cell within our body. So heart cell, lung cell, sperm cell, egg cell, the mitochondria are what generate energy for that cell so that it can survive and it's incredibly affected by our environment and it's affected by um, any form of oxidation. So diet and lifestyle changes and things like that. So it's really important and really crucial that we improve the health of the mitochondria. Fertility and reproductive health clinician Leia Hechtman knows the importance of mitochondrial energy production, especially as we age. But thankfully, our cells also contain a powerful fat-soluble antioxidant, ubiquinol. It may support heart health, healthy cholesterol, and assist in male fertility. So ubiquinol works in a number of different areas, but most of the research centralises around sperm health. And so when we look at sperm, we look at three main parameters. We look at sperm count, so the number of sperm per ejaculate. Uh, we look at sperm motility, which is the movement of sperm. And we look at morphology, so the shape of sperm. And when you dive into the research, you can see that ubiquinol is actually concentrated within the actual structure of sperm. And so, for example, it's concentrated in the tail of sperm, so we know that it assists in the movement of sperm and helps them to swim faster and get to the goal. And we know that it's um, concentrated in the neck and the head, so we know it's heavily involved in the structure, so the morphology, but also the DNA, which is found within the head and the neck of the sperm. So the DNA is the information that goes from the male sperm into the female egg, and then that's the information that gets carried over and creates our children. So ubiquinol is found naturally occurring in the human body, um, but equally it's also found in our diet. Uh, main sources are things like um, organ meats, red meats, egg yolks, also found in leafy greens, but the most important thing to be mindful of is the amount that we need, often exceeds what we can actually naturally consume. While diet is always important, so is advice from a health practitioner during the conception process. Their recommendations will put you in good stead on the journey to parenthood, when the real work begins. Now, Dr Nick, people who watch the show will know you usually from our Doctor's Past and Present segments, which you do with your beautiful daughter, Dr Isabel. So, I'm going to assume from that that you're obviously very close to your children. Well, I'm pretty lucky, Joe. I've got three kids, and it's really because of my wonderful wife. <laughs> she made it possible for me to be a good dad. Yeah, so you spent a lot of time with them when they were first born? Yeah, it was one of the things I was lucky enough to be able to do is take a day off from work when the kids were born. So I had a full day home midweek when I was a stay-at-home dad, and that gave my wife a chance to go off and go back to work part-time. Fabulous. Yes. Well, you might have seen in the headlines with calls for dads to get more paid parental leave, which I'm very passionate about. It would have been nice because no one paid me to stay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's true, but it's obviously beneficial to the family and mums who need the support, and it absolutely contributes to gender equality, generally speaking, for dads to get paid parental leave. But it's obviously ideal for the dad to be with their kids as much as possible as well. Well, there's plenty of research, Joe, to show that dads spending more time with their kids creates really good outcomes in terms of social health, mental health, even intellectual health. And certainly from my point of view, I've always said it was the best investment I ever made when I was a young man, was investing the time with the kids. Well, I was really lucky that my husband was actually the stay-at-home parent when we had our daughter and I went back to work. And still now, we share the load evenly and his relationship with our daughter is amazing. Is it really even? Well, look, ah. I will say... <laughs> <laughs> that, generally speaking, he looks after the outside-the-house mm. stuff. Yeah. So he does the gardening mm. and, you know, all that mm. kind of messy stuff. Do you divvy up the chores? Well, yes, I, I look after that tiny little patch of grass we call the lawn. That's yes. mine. You know, don't get the, the scissors out and do that. And my main job inside the house is the cooking. Oh, So we, try, we try and keep my wife away from the kitchen, so <laughs> that becomes my job. <laughs> all right. Well, when it comes to our house, we leave the composting up to Daz and someone who's never afraid to get his hands dirty, especially when it comes to food and nature, is Luke Hines. The kitchen guru recently gave us the basics of starting a home compost. He's re-teamed with sustainability expert Lottie Delziel to tell us how to turn meal scraps into mulch no matter what size space you live in. Now, the last time we caught up, we talked about composting in general. But today I want to talk about different types of composting 
and whether you can do it in different spaces. I mean, some people don't even have a backyard or a balcony. So what are the different types of composting? So if you want to start composting, you need to think about how much you really want to get your hands dirty. Because if you don't want to get your hands dirty, then you can still compost as well. So there's an amazing app called Share Waste. And what that does is it connects you with people in your local neighbourhood who have got a compost bin and want your food scraps. So all you need to do is collect all of your scraps and then walk around the corner and drop them off at your neighbour's place. Will they also look after my dishes once I've made dinner? <laughs> Depends on your neighbourhood, I guess. Oh, I'm downloading that app today. It sounds really, really good. So at first we're in the kitchen. Obviously there's people who don't have a yard. So there's tiny spaces. Maybe all they've got is a tiny balcony, not even that, a windowsill. What options do we have? So for them, what I would recommend is a bakashi bin. So pretty much what a bakashi bin is, is it's an anaerobic way of composting, which means no oxygen. I'd pretty much call this a massive Tupperware container. And what we're going to do is you literally just put all of your food and veggie scraps into here and then let it ferment and break down and you pop the lid back on. So this could go into your laundry, it could go into your kitchen sink, it could go in your garage. And then once you've finished, you'd use something like the Share Waste app to find somebody to bury all of this goodness. Does this get stinky? It can get a little bit smelly, but that's why with this one you can actually get a little spray and that spray helps everything break down nice and quickly, but it also hides those bad smells as well. But another amazing benefit of this one is that you've got this little tap at the bottom here and out of here comes liquid gold in the form of this delicious, nutrient-dense fertiliser okay. that you can then pour onto your... Um, indoor plants. I feel like we've nailed some incredible options for those that don't have a large space or an outdoor area, but then there's a whole new world of composting when we head outside. Yes, that's right. I actually call it an old world because it's been around for so long, but we're just getting back into it. So. Right. Is this where I get my hands dirty? Yep, let's oh, do it. All right. <laughs> Okay, okay, what a setup you've got for me here. Lottie, look at this. It's I feel like scary. I'm surrounded by presents and toys. <laughs> so run me through what we've got. From small space perspective, inside we're talking a bakashi, but outside on, say, a deck or a very small balcony, we can use one of these, which is... A worm farm. A worm farm! Yes. So worm farms are great when you've got a shady spot. So it could be a shady corner of your garden, but also if you've got an apartment, so you've got a balcony or even in your garage. So a worm farm is kind of like a triple-storey house. We've got the bottom here, which is the toilet. We've got the middle, which is your bedroom or where all of the worms will sleep. And we've got the top, and that's the kitchen. So that's where all of the food scraps go. And then the worms travel between all of the different layers and have a great time. So if I'm a beginner here and I've just got this, what do I fill each layer with? So all you need to do is grab yourself some worms. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. I brought you some worms today. <laughs> So oh. in here we have got some live worms for you. I wonder if I can find any or if they're a little bit camera shy. I've got to say, when I'm walking around my local store, I don't see a yellow box full of worms. Where do I get them? Just from your hardware. You can even order them online and get them sent to you through the post. Show me. Oh, look at him. Can I touch him? <laughs> Go for oh, it. Oh, hello. So worms are very, very hungry beings. They don't like the sunlight, which is why he's probably squirming away a little bit now. But they eat probably about three to four times their body weight in food each and every week. The bottom will become where their castings go, so where all of their poo kind of gathers and then we've got this tap at the front here. So this tap is where we're going to actually be able to withdraw what's called lechate and what that is is it's a great natural fertiliser that you can then put straight onto your garden. So the worm poo is what we want? Worm poo and then this liquid is also what we want. So it's a kind of a bit of both. You get two amazing benefits from having a worm farm. So this is a 500 box, a box of 500 yeah, worms. There's 500 worms 500 in there. 500 worms in oh, here. Oh, wow. Approximately. Oh, locally grown, good. Approximately. But they will actually reproduce probably three or four times in a matter of months. So you're going to get all of these amazing worms, so you may as well take some out. You could give them to a friend who's just started to get a worm farm, or you could also put them into your garden as well. Oh, I'm going to be giving worms to all of my friends. Worms for Christmas. Oh, actually, I'm a bit itchy and hungry. Maybe I've got worms already. <laughs>
changing tactics yes. here. I just want to talk about pregnancy a little bit, right? I remember when I was pregnant, it was really hard for me. I looked at all the other women who seemed to be full of joy and I was like, why am I feeling so anxious all the time? I felt sick and exhausted. It was not a great time. How about for you? I agree. Actually, I think women put a lot of pressure on ourselves, don't we, to feel a certain way. I think for me, I had such bad morning sickness mm. that kind of went throughout my pregnancy. So I had that over the top of it and working full time as well. By the end of the day, just trying, trying to stay awake, it was tough. Yeah, it is tough for you. We put pressure on ourselves to work because we love our jobs. Mm. We don't want to sacrifice that or many of us have to keep working. And that struggle of physically, you know, creating a child and working at the same time, it's really, really tough. The juggle is real and working mums-to-be are definitely in the majority here in Australia. Recent ABS statistics show 73% of women with a child under two held a job at some stage during their pregnancy. Around the same number returned to work after spending at least four months at home with their new barber. I don't know about you, Joe, but for me, I went pretty much straight back to work after couple, a couple of weeks. Yes, I did return straight to work after only four weeks and, yeah, I don't know if that was the mm. right choice, but, but I loved my job. I was torn. That's part of the problem with being mums. We're torn, aren't we? We're so sort of split between the work we love and being with our children. I can't imagine, though, sweating it out in one of the mm. toughest non-contact sports netball with a baby on board. I mean, playing netball when you're pregnant, not for me. These athletes are amazing and that's exactly what Aussie Super Netball star April Brandley did while pregnant with her son, Clay. I caught up with the champion goalkeeper to find out how she scores major points in life on and off the court. My mum was a huge influence in me getting into netball. Um, she was heavily involved in our local um, netball club and I just grew up around the sport. My two sisters played, um, my mum played while I was in her tummy, <laughs> which is pretty cool, so I was playing at a quite early age. <laughs> but yeah, even now, um, playing and having my son, I don't know, I just feel more connected to her being a mum now and still being able to do the sport that I love. Losing my mum was tough for all of us. My two older sisters and my older brother, we all dealt with it quite differently being at different ages and she was in remission for a while after getting breast cancer so we thought it would all be sweet um, and then it obviously came back so that was pretty, pretty rough but um, I guess it makes you look at life a bit differently and have a like quite a different perspective because you know that anything can sort of change in the moment and just be grateful for the moments that you have right now so yeah, I am forever grateful for the time that I had with her and obviously breast cancer and cancer in general sucks, but I think it's really cool to be doing stuff with the McGrath Foundation and all that kind of stuff because we're getting so much further with science and early detection with breast cancer, which is super important as well. When I think of her, I just think of this big smile and laugh, like she was very... I think when you first meet her, she was quiet, but when you got to know her, she's like super outgoing. And I just remember her laugh. It was, I used to get so embarrassed as a kid when she would laugh because she was so loud. Now I think I've got the laugh. <laughs> but no, just her passion. And I think anyone that she met always felt better after meeting her. She just had that really nice energy about her. And yeah, I definitely miss her. I think being 15, there's so many different things happening in your life. It's just a tough time, I guess. And for me, I just threw myself into netball as like my happy place away from all like the kind of hard stuff. I could just sort of push it to the side and focus in and be present in the moment. So it was really a good escape for me at the time. The greatest things about it is the, the peaks that you get, the adrenaline rush and, you know, playing in front of your home crowd, like you really hit those high endorphins that come out. And then obviously, which come with that is the lows that you get as well. So it's like almost like a roller coaster ride at times, which is what you love, but it also is quite hard to manage. So I think it's really important um, that you have sort of things away from the game to take your mind away, you know, whether it's, you know, taking a dog for a walk, going to the park with your kid, going for a swim in the ocean, I think like, I just look at this sport or any sport and a lot of it is mental. So I think you've got to look after that side away from the game. So when you come onto the court, you're ready to go. Because in netball, if you mentally switch off for two minutes, it can change a whole game. So the mental, the mental work that you do is really important. I think um, having a kid has been the best thing for me, but it's also a, good, a really good test for my mental fitness. Um, yeah, no, I love having him around. It's the best. Um, I think it gives me, it keeps me really grounded, I think. I, um, when I was younger, which is 
totally normal. Like I was just, you know, full head in, netball was everything, which I think it's normal when you're younger, but I feel like coming back now, I can enjoy the sport a lot more just because I have a bit more of a um, perspective. Um, you know, once I finish court work, it's straight into mum mode. And then I come here and the girls are awesome and they take him for me and I can lock in with the girls and get, you know, some solid court work done. I'm just loving it. I feel so lucky to be able to do it. The Giants who sit behind, but finals means anything. April Branley coming up with a cracking intercept there, just getting a two feet off the ground. I just got a whole new appreciation for my body and what it could do to be able to grow a human and then stretch and expand and then come back in when I needed to, because I came back on court five months after I had him and it was really quite, I felt a little bit scared because I felt so confident in my body for so long and, you know, my body is my machine and it allows me to do what I can do before I had a kid and then after I had clay it, it felt really foreign just because it wasn't so much mine anymore and I was still breastfeeding and um, I just look back now and I just sort of think like what a, like thank you body like you're amazing it's just it's capable of so much more than what we what we know and I think um, something that helped me was doing a lot of that kind of work to keep my kind of fitness and strength up during my pregnancy which really helped me on the comeback to court but yeah, definitely was nervous the first time I hit the court after five or a year and a half away from it. I actually have studied doing Pilates, so that has helped me heaps getting back on court and feeling strong. I think the biggest thing is feeling confident in everything as well. So it was a bit scary, but um, seeing a women's health physio was my first step and that was um, really important to feeling confident and strong again and just kind of trying to hit the milestones as much as I can because there's not that much information for women coming back from pregnancy. You know, obviously representing Australia and everything like that, that was an awesome experience. I absolutely loved it. And now it's, it's like brought me into a new phase of my life where it's balancing it with family life and I'm loving it more than ever, which is so awesome. So at different stages of my life, it's been a different thing, which I've drawn from it. But in terms of like personal, it's provided me so much like, I would not be the person I am today without netball and I'm so grateful for it. I love being surprised by the health benefits of certain foods GQ. Take celery, for example. It's not just a fantastic low-calorie snack, or means for delivering dip. Too true, Hunty. Celery contains a plant compound called apigenin. It has anti-inflammatory as well as diuretic and anti-rheumatic properties. All of these things sound amazing, but what do they actually do? Well, being an anti-inflammatory and anti-rheumatic is beneficial for our musculoskeletal system and the arthritic conditions that can affect it. Including reducing the aches and pains, which target bones, ligaments, muscles, tendons and joints. Correct. Celery also decreases the build-up of uric acid in the body. So combined with being an anti-inflammatory, it makes it ideal for treating gout, commonly found in our big toes. And finally, celery has been used in traditional Western herbal medicine to increase urine output, flushing out toxins from our body and maintaining healthy kidneys. So many jobs, but I don't need any convincing to eat more of it. I think it is delicious. Not everybody does, Heinzi. Some people don't like the watery, crunchy texture. And for those people, celery is available in a convenient, high-strength supplement form. Well, that works out for me. More dip and celery for me. <laughs> See, I think you'd be a double dipper. That's bad. Oh, I love a double dip. If you're coming to a party with me, be warned. I dip, I triple, I thrush dip. I, I quadruple, I thrush, I quadruple thrush dip. No, it's making me feel ill. Oh! <laughs> The A to Z of Vitamins is brought to you by Go Healthy's Go Celery 16,000 One a Day. A convenient, high strength, one a day formulation to help relieve mild rheumatic aches and pains. Now, Dr. Nick, there are so many branches of medicine. What drew you to general practice? Well, I tried out all sorts of different jobs when I was a young doctor. I worked in paediatrics, which I loved, but then I loved geriatrics as well. And I realised I like all of this work, so I'd better be a GP.
I like it. Well, the family physician or GP is right at the top of the list in most in-demand medical practitioners, along with physios, anaesthetists and psychiatrists. Yes, well, that latter, Joe, makes sense because mental health recently topped the list of people's long-term health problems as registered on the latest national census. Well, according to New South Wales Health, if you're considering a career in medicine, there's huge demand in pathology, paediatrics and, I wouldn't have guessed this one, dermatology. Winter can have harsh and detrimental effects to our skin, not only because of the dry climate, but also what we do to it. For example, having long hot showers, electric blankets, use of heaters, these can dry the skin out and also cause irritable, itchy skin. As dermatologists, we always emphasise the importance of a skincare routine. Using a soap-free cleanser and a quality moisturiser is incredibly important. One of the uh, hero ingredients that we've used in dermatology for generations is the use of colloidal oatmeal to soothe, hydrate and draw moisture into the skin to alleviate dry, irritable skin. There are products available such as lotions that is suitable for the face and hair bearing areas, all the way to creams that help hydrate and protect the natural skin barrier. As a dermatologist and consumer, it's really important to have a trusted brand for the family and look for ingredients such as colloidal oatmeal and shea butter, but also properties in that uh, range that helps to protect the skin barrier, helps to balance the skin's natural pH, as well as uh, supporting uh, the skin's natural microbiome through prebiotic properties. In my clinical practice, I always emphasise the importance of moisturising all year round. In doing so, it will allow your skin to always look and feel its best. It's no secret I love my fruits and veggies, whether it's a big pot of hot pumpkin soup in the middle of winter or stewed apples with fresh yoghurt. It's not just about it being comfort food, it's about it being the type of food that makes you feel good from the inside out. Now, there's that saying that food can be medicine and nobody knows that more than Rosemary Damore. <laughs> Rosemary, there is no doubt that you are an icon of Hampton Street, Brighton. Can you tell me a little bit about the place? I have inherited the passion for food from my parents. It's been in my family uh, for 60 years, the fruit and veggie game, and I think I've got a story or two to share with my customers. <laughs> I am the biggest fan of avocados. These actually saved my life about 25 years ago. She's not lying. Rosemary suffered chronic gut problems before she changed her diet to include not one, not two, but between three and five avocados a day. Firstly, I noticed my energy levels um, skyrocketed. It just enriched my skin, my hair, my nails, and it helped with my, my weight. What I love about that is that avocados are a really fantastic source of healthy fats, particularly monounsaturated fats, which are good for heart health. But as you said, they keep you feeling fuller for longer, so they help you maintain healthy body weight. It's a little bit obvious that you're such a fan because uh, if you hold that close to your top, you've come as an avocado today. <laughs> I think that was planned. You, you, <laughs> you Citrus fruit is now in season. We've got our mandarins, our oranges, grapefruits, lemons and limes for our gin and tonics. <laughs> As well as the gin and tonic, I love citrus fruits because of their health benefits. In particular, the plant antioxidants, which help fight against free radical damage, which can result in illness and ageing. Plus, they're packed with vitamin C, which is fantastic for our immune system, especially at this time of year. G&Ts aside, Rosemary's a vitamin C convert. After changing up her family's diet, came with some unexpected benefits. My daughter, as a toddler, she suffered from dry, cracked lips. And this went on for years. So I lowered my daughter's sugar intake, increased the fruits and vegetables, and it was the vitamin C levels in her diet and the low sugar that helped promote her healing her dried lips. It makes a lot of sense because vitamin C actually helps our natural production of collagen, which in turn promotes healthy skin. 
When you're looking for one of the healthiest vegetables, you cannot go past broccoli. It is a nutrient powerhouse, and it's in good company as part of the cruciferous family, with friends such as cauliflower, kale, and even Brussels sprouts. Are you a fan? I am a big fan, Luke. I've actually got a customer who eats it every day. He turns it into broccoli soup, and it helps him with his prostate. That's because broccoli is packed high with an antioxidant specific for reducing inflammation, which would have been playing a role in that man's life by incorporating it into the soup. And it also protects against oxidative stress, something we come in contact with each and every day. But wait, there's more. Move over, broccoli. Your little brother kicks an even more powerful roundhouse. I also garnish my broccoli soup with broccoli sprouts. They have 10 times more powerful antioxidants than just your ordinary broccoli. I'm a massive fan of those sprouts. Perfect for on top of a soup or even jammed into your sanger at lunch. Definitely. And if you're after a killer green soup, Bring on Rosemary's badass broccoli broth. Saute onion, garlic and chilli. Steam broccoli for three to five minutes and blend the lot. Yum! I have to say that broccoli soup isn't one that comes to mind when I do attempt to whip up a soup. Not that I often whip up soups and I tell you, getting my kid to eat broccoli soup would be quite a challenge, but it's an easy recipe and by all accounts tastes great. So I'm going to give it a go. What about you, Jack? My kids love broccoli, but I'm not sure whether they'd eat it in a soup, but that's actually the only vegetable they do eat is broccoli. Lucky. I know. How did you get those? <laughs> I remember my daughter, when she was really young, used to go to the supermarket and pick them up off the shelf and eat them raw. Oh, now you're showing <laughs> off now. <laughs> that's the only nice thing that they eat. But as you said, Joe, the key word is easy. I'm not one who spends huge amounts of time in the kitchen, but when I do, I love it and I'm full throttle into it. I love making pastas, actually, from scratch, and I love cooking a pasta, but my husband refuses to eat pasta, so I don't know if it's actually my cooking or not. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Dr Nick? Have you got any interest in cooking? Uh, actually, I'm a bit of a keen chef. And during, during COVID, um, I got quite interested in Korean food. So everything with kimchi. Well, you are both putting me to shame, I have to say, because I only cook because we need to eat, basically. <laughs> That's all we have time for today. I'll be back on the airwaves with Gerald Quigley this Sunday on the House of Wellness radio show. And don't miss the House of Wellness lift out with a focus on beauty and skin, so check it out and give yourself a pamper while you're at it. Dr Nick, thanks so much for filling in for Das while he's been away. It's been absolutely lovely to have you. It's been lovely to be here, Jo. Das will be back with us next week. Thanks also to our friends at Chemist Warehouse and until next time, bye for now. See you.